in the countries of the empire, Britain had so much control that it was easy to make sure that British products were the first to be sold. But now, of course, the empire has long since gone, and with it the advantages it gave British industry. That easy market for British goods has disappeared. The effect on South Wales was disastrous. Bit by bit, two of the most important things that put its industry on the map were being whittled away. Today, the old industries hang on, just. 25 coal mines are still working. That's half the number of 10 years ago. On the southern edge of the region, on the sea coast, steel too is still there. In South Wales nowadays, there are just two large steelworks left. 30 years ago, there were 16 still working, and 30 years before that, there were so many, nobody ever bothered to count them. This is one of the two still going, in the town of Port Talbot. The locals used to have a nickname for it. They called it Treasure Island, a place where a lot of people worked and took home a lot of money at the end of the week. Treasure Island gets nearly all its raw materials by ship from overseas. This is Polish coal coming in. The next load might be from Australia, the United States, or from anywhere where the price is right. The inside of the steelworks has recently been totally rebuilt. 187 million pounds worth of new equipment was in store. Port Talbot is now reckoned to be the best equipped steelworks in Europe. And this is where most of that 187 million pounds went, in the rebuilding of the hot strip mill. Treasure Island, though, has lost thousands of workers in the process. Computers now look after the progress of steel through the plant. Modernization has meant that Port Talbot steel sells at a competitive price. It's also meant that the main part of the rolling mill can be left in the hands of just two people. The old that's still running. The old that shut down. The South Wales landscape gives a sharp, clear picture of the comings and goings of industry. But the scene is by no means complete without the latest arrival. This is the new part of the picture, the industrial estate. An industrial estate is just a bunch of buildings. Neat, tidy, often laid out with plenty of trees and grass. Compared to the belching chimneys and clouds of smoke of the old industrial areas, there's nothing very spectacular about them. I don't think you'd find artists nowadays getting excited enough to want to do pictures of them. Not like the artists of the 19th century, who you may remember from the last program, were obviously fascinated by what they saw. Industrial estates crop up all over South Wales. In fact, they're in every single one of Britain's old industrial regions. So the question, what are they all doing here, is an important one. To answer it, we need a quick recap. 
Remember the two important reasons I chose for the old industries coming to South Wales. Thanks to them, industry made money and turned in a profit. Take them away, though, and that's exactly what's happened. And what happens then? How does industry make its money now? In fact, where are the reasons for industry coming here at all? What an industrial estate does is to give to a company different reasons to set up shop. It tries to make it worthwhile for a firm to move in. This is how it works. It does vary from place to place, but here's the general gist of it. A company setting up in South Wales in an old industrial town can move into a brand new ready-made building, or they can get one specially made to their own design. And the building, in the beginning anyway, might even be rent-free. The company can get grants to help pay for new machinery. And in some places, the new firm might get as much as £3,000 for each new job they bring to the area. All this put together means that the firm is getting money to help them set up. In a way, they're being paid to come here. And it's this system that has kept new industry coming to all the old industrial regions in Britain. One of the biggest industrial estates in South Wales is on the edge of a town called Bridgend. I'm just a few hundred metres from Bridgend Industrial Estate and it's no coincidence that I'm looking down on a motorway because the fact is there's nothing an industrial estate likes more than being right next to a decent road. What they're really looking for, so say the new industries, is good access. A place that's quick and easy to get in and out of. Access, for instance, is crucial for this shoe factory. It makes 50,000 pairs of shoes a week. Their two main customers are Marks and Spencer and CNAs, who both have branches all over the country. So, with that sort of production and that sort of market to cover, your best bet is to be at a spot that links directly to the country's motorway network. At Bridgen, just like any other industrial estate, pretty well any industry you can think of might crop up. This, believe it or not, is the start of the production line in a sweet factory. The raw materials like sugar, chocolate, nuts and so on come from all over the world. Half the finished product goes for export. What comes into this factory and half of what goes out is therefore international. So good transport links are all important. Access again. This strange creature lives in the best-known factory on the Bridgend estate, that of a Japanese television manufacturer. The firm set up here in the 1970s, attracted by the grants and subsidies available and the fact that it brought them nearer their European market. What this firm has done is the same as many big international companies, don't stick to one place, 
but spread your factories round a number of countries throughout the world. The way industrial estates have worked out is not all good news. True enough, they've brought in jobs, jobs taken by many of the people who used to work in coal and steel. But as for the kinds of jobs available, the estates, more often than not, end up with the ordinary run-of-the-mill work, screwdriver jobs, someone once called them. The high-powered jobs, on the other hand, stay at the company's headquarters outside the area, often indeed in another country. There are places, though, where new industry is not keen on going to at all. The out-of-the-way spots, like the small mining towns in the coal valleys. New roads have been built to make access better, but there are limits to how far off the beaten track new industry is prepared to go. One idea is that the coal towns could make something out of tourism. After all, tourists spend £5 billion a year in Britain, and many of them already visit the country areas right on the industrial town's doorstep. Is there a way, then, that towns could attract visitors and have a slice of the action? Well, so some people think. At least they do here at this old mine in the Rhondda Valley, one of the most famous areas of coal mining in the past. Mind you, there's not a beach or a seaside resort for miles, but what they're going to try to do is to give visitors a fair range of attractions for their money. They'll be fixing up the buildings, putting a polish on the machinery, there'll be a mining museum, and there'll be trips underground too. Just outside the mine, there'll be a boating lake and a children's playground, and up on the hill behind, there are plans for a cable car and a dry ski slope. At this place, they've made a start with that kind of idea. The name of the mine is Big Pit, near the town of Blynavon. It stopped mining coal in 1980, and now it's geared up for visitors. They get holidaymakers and school groups, about 105,000 visitors in all every year. It's £2.25 for a guided tour, and the mine employs 60 people, including 30 ex-miners. That's nothing compared with the days when coal was doing well, yet it's a brave step in a place where the story today is one of industry moving out rather than coming in. In a way, these visitors of the 1980s are being taken back to near the beginning of that story of industry in South Wales. And it's the same story as the one we've covered in these two programmes. Six in the old money. That's seventy and a half pence in the day's money. 
And of course, the man that I work with, chap in the McGowan went his name was, he used to have to pay my wages as well, and by his own food. I'd like to know what my wages was in that day, of course. It was only 70 to 6 a week or 75 pence. That was our way. Forth travels through stretches from the mountainside of Ben Lomond all the way to the estuary called the Firth of Forth. The river's journey ends at the point where it meets the sea, with Dunbar on the south side of the estuary and the East Nuke villages of Fife, including Pithing Weem, on the north side. The land around the river is known as the Forth Basin, and the people who have lived here over the centuries have relied on the river and the land around it to make a living. In the Ochil Hills, where the tributaries of the River Forth are in their upper course, the power of the water was needed by the first big mill owner. In the floodplain of the River Forth itself, where it's in its lower course, the river has long been used as a means of transport, and heavy industries have set up on the flatland near the river. And where the estuary meets the sea, the fishermen have gone in pursuit of a living. Pit and Weem lies in the east nuke of Fife on the north side of the Forth estuary. For hundreds of years, this village and its neighbours have had an association with the fishing industry. When I was a boy, everybody chased the shoals of hern, which were out here in the first of fourth and doing off trail. Could you imagine the hern boats then when I was young? The women followed the hern shoals, the men that made the hern barrels, the coopers followed the hern shoals, the coal merchants, because there were a hell of a lot of steam drifters, they followed the hern shoals. But for carrying coal, everybody, the ones Right, and then, and when I was a boy, it, there were 20 people ashore depending on one man going to the sea. Now, they reckon there's about seven people ashore depending on every crew man aboard these boats. The people of the villages in the East Nuke of Fife, like Crail, Anstruther, and here in Pitt and Weem, have traditionally relied on fishing for their livelihood. But now, with the decline in fish stocks, how long can this go on? Next door to Pitt and Weem is Anstruther. It used to have a very busy harbour full of fishing boats, but today it lies almost empty. There are no longer enough fish in the sea to make it worthwhile keeping the harbour working. Tourists visit the area because the old fishing village is pretty and peaceful. But the tourist industry does not provide the number of jobs that the fishing industry did. Back in Pitt and Weem, the harbour is busy enough, but there's not a herring in sight. Nowadays, these vessels you see going to sea, they're concentrating on prawns, you know, the leaf up scampi of it. How important is it for the area, the fishing, well, mainly the, the crabs and the shellfish now, how important is that to the economy of the area? Oh, very important, very important. The whole area is, 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 is now relies on, I would say, the prawn fishing. 
Despite the decline in fish stocks, the harbour looks prosperous enough. The fishermen who land their catch here come from all over the country and they sell their goods in the newly built fish market. The market was paid for partly by funds from the European community, but whether it will remain open for long will depend on the level of fish stocks in the sea around the Firth of Forth. Further up the estuary, you'll find lots of pretty villages that used to make their living from fishing, but now no longer. North Queen's Ferry is one of them, and is now made up of many commuters who travel to nearby Edinburgh to work in its service industries. But there's a tourist attraction in town that creates jobs for a few locals who don't want to commute. They may no longer catch fish, but their job's still a fishy business. This is an example of a new industry that's really taken off here in North Queen's Ferry. It's not a primary industry like fishing, but a service industry. What's on offer here is fish, but you can't eat them. This is a tourist attraction. The underwater safari at Deep Sea Wannell takes you on a tour of the fish you can find in the British Isles, with the added attraction of a few American sharks without having to get wet. Since the centre opened in 1993, it has attracted over one million visitors to North Queen's Ferry, and its success means that local people have found jobs in administration, sales and catering within the site. And it looks as though it's here to stay. Edinburgh Castle is the only place in Scotland to bring in more tourists. Alva, Tillacutri and Dollar lie at the foot of the Ochil Hills, which explains why they are called the Hillfoot Villages. The tributaries in the Ochil Hills form part of the catchment area of the River Forth. 